Welcome to this afternoon's keynote lecture. I am Omar Knio, Professor of Applied Mathematics and Computational Science, Chair of the 2018 Enrichment Program. I am honored to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tariq Fadak of King Abdulaziz University and the Shura Council. Dr. Fadak holds a Bachelor's of Science degree, a Master's degree in Management, and a Doctorate in Urban Planning. His experience sp spans industry, academia, and public service. He started his career as consultant for a United Nations project in Riyadh, and then as a researcher in urban planning at Harvard. Dr. Fadak then joined the Department of Urban Planning at KAU and served as chair of the department from 85 to 91. He was fellow of the Harvard Graduate School of Design from 2002 to 2008, served as head of Jeddah City Council from 2007 to 2009, and member of the City Council from 2007 to 2011. Starting 2009, doc Dr. Fadak serves on the Shura Council, namely in the Committee for Housing, Water, and Public Services. He's, he has received a number of awards, including the American Association of Architectural Colleges Award in 96, and a KAU Bus Applied Study Award in Urban Design in 1991. He has authored over 900 articles touching on a variety of topics in sciences, technology, aviation, urban planning, and housing. I've been fortunate to have several discussions with Dr. Fadak uh, about the planning of the spring enrichment program and his participation, and really been fortunate that in the process I learned a number of things, including how to put a lecture together, how to engage the audience, and a, 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 a few anecdotes as well about prime numbers. I'm really looking forward to his lecture today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fadak to the Spring Enrichment Program. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, this is the truth. I, uh, I really wish to thank you very, very much for having me. Um, and uh, I like to refer to a, a Swahili greeting. I think it's Swahili, where they ask people, e people ask each other, how are your dreams? So instead of saying, how are you, they ask, how are your dreams? And uh, I keep saying this, my dreams have been great because I've been dreaming about beauty for the last few weeks uh, preparing for this lecture. And it's not really a lecture, it's really sharing some thoughts that I have about the topic, because I cannot claim to be an expert in this area. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, science and beauty, and it's, uh, it's kind of a difficult topic to talk about, because uh, one thinks, is it really science and beauty, or science in beauty, or science of beauty? So lots of choices there. But let me start with a story about a face, one particular face. Uh, this is Hedy Lamar, and uh, Hedy Lamar was supposed to be one of the prettiest women of the 20th century, Austrian lady, an actress in Hollywood. And uh, she invented uh, frequency hopping, which is a technology we all use today in our mobile phones. Every time you make a phone call or use your GPS, or convey a signal between two um, uh, mobile phones, uh, or between a source and a, a recipient, you, uh, you use frequency hopping. And apparently, this lady invented uh, frequency hopping, the whole concept. And uh, she went to um, the US Navy to sell this idea. And uh, they, they laughed her out. They, they shunned the whole idea, because they thought, how can a pretty lady who is a famous Hollywood actress try to sell us a system for guiding a torpedo. And it didn't make any sense. It would be the equivalence of, uh, I guess, Kim Kardashian trying to sell a cure for cancer, or something equivalent to that. So um, her, her, uh, her patent wasn't really taken seriously until about uh, 20 years uh, uh, later. And uh, so 
her pretty face actually was something that acted against her. Now, I have another example of another face, and this is Frank Abigail, and some of you might have seen the movie uh, Catch Me If You Can. He was one of the biggest con artists of the 20th century, and he was able to elude the FBI and the Department of Treasury in the United States for a very, very long time. And uh, part of his, um, uh, his, uh, his the, one of his main assets was his good looks, and this was played by uh, this handsome-looking uh, actor. But the, these are real stories, one face that acted against somebody, another face that acted uh, for somebody. So this is just a story to get us started. Um, I'd like to use another story. This is more of a joke, really, but as I was mentioning, most of my jokes are not really funny, but they have a, but they have a story to tell. And in this uh, particular one, uh, this is... Uh, the turtle is Crush, if you've seen the movie Finding Nemo. And Crush was taking um, two, uh, the two fish are uh, uh, Nemo and Dory. Dory is the blue one. And um, they're riding uh, the current towards Australia. And uh, Crush asks uh, Dory, how is the current and the water temperature? She goes, current is great, temperature is great, but what's water? So we live in an environment full of beauty, but sometimes it's difficult to define it, as the two fish, as the story tells. So um, uh, beauty, of course, has a lot of definitions. It's important because it represents truth and culture and happiness and comfort and civility, etc. cetera, um, in, in terms of beliefs in uh, in, old, uh, in all religions, um, uh, beauty plays a very, very important part. Um, but we, we find it difficult to, to put an exact definition to beauty. And we also might find sometimes difficulty putting a, a good definition for science. But a sampling of traits of beauty are size, uh, shape, accuracy, uh, design, proportion. I'm an urban planner by, by, by training, and um, for us, design and proportion are very, very important. Unfortunately, most of the cities that I know are not very, very uh, beautiful. Uh, so we, 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 urban planners often fail in doing this, but it, they, they, know what, they know what it is, but they, they just can't put their finger on it. Um, by the way, I'm partial to eggs. I love eggs, so that's why I have it in this slide. Uh, eggs just happen to be one of my weaknesses. So we have also weight and function, uh, meaning, etc. So all of these uh, traits are in beauty. Uh, and beauty is sometimes very painful uh, uh, because a lot of people go to great lengths for, uh, for beauty, as we see in this, uh, in this uh, photograph of the Chinese lady uh, compressing her, her feet because small feet are a sign of beauty in old China. And beauty can also be very um, exorbitant. The costs can be very high. More, more money is spent on, on beauty products than is spent on books, which is very sad, I think, but it's the truth. Um, so some of the questions we'll ask today are, is beauty a relative concept, or can we, is it an awakening? Is it something inside of us that we can uh, express? Or is there a scientific uh, way to look at beauty and to describe it? So, um, of course, some, sometimes beauty is always relevant. I mean, you know, a lizard will find uh, another lizard uh, beautiful, I'm sure, or else they wouldn't mate, or a donkey, uh, exam uh, another example, but we wouldn't find them particularly attractive. So our plan for today is that we'll, we'll look at scale as um, a sign of uh, one of the indicators of beauty, and I'll show how and why it can be a sign of beauty. We'll look at senses, our senses, and how they can fool us, and how they can lead us to beauty sometimes, and away from it in other times. And then we look at some uh, faces and shapes and numbers. So to start with, when we look at scale, we have to remember that we are giants. Human beings are giants. I mean, if you ever read Gulliver's Travels, and uh, uh, humans rank way up there. And, uh, and in terms of the scale of all, uh, uh, things in the universe, uh, we, are, we are really very, we're really quite large. So that kind of colors our picture because of the things that we can see and the things we can feel, um, the things we can imagine, 
are a little different than, than they would be. Uh, and I'd like to use uh, scale to also indicate uh, strength and some uh, other characteristics, such as heat dissipation. Now, I'm sure that you know about the uh, scale ruling with, um, with the creatures. Whenever they get uh, larger, they get weaker compared to their body size. So when we start with, uh, with mosquitoes or ants, for example, are extremely strong compared to their body size, compared to, for example, rats. This is Ratatouille from the movie Ratatouille, of course. Uh, and to elephants. Elephants, uh, as you can see, the, the, the stump, the, uh, the, their, their legs are so huge just to carry them around, uh, whereas uh, mosquitoes can have very, very skinny legs, and they can even lose a leg or two, and they can still uh, manage to get by. And next, if we look in terms of also of scale at our metabolism, which is really the fire that keeps us going, uh, we'll find that there is a, there is a, a very, very beautiful relationship between all creatures um, in that there, you, you can relate metabolism from creatures from uh, large and, and, and small, which is also very, which is, I think, kind of unexpected. Heartbeats is another one, about uh, 1.5 billion beats in a lifetime. So that, just, that blows my mind that all creatures have the same more or less heartbeat. It's really uh, an amazing, I think, uh, an amazing relationship. So we all have the same heartbeats in a lifetime. A mouse will have the same heartbeats as I do. A mouse lifespan, of course, is much less than me, hopefully. So it's, uh, uh, but, but it all follows the same sort of relationship. When we talk about uh, surface to volume ratios, and we find that uh, size also creates huge advantages for surface to volume ratios, for not just for, uh, for land creatures, but as well as uh, sea creatures, and of course, including uh, plants. So in terms of strength, cooling, and respiration, um, I have this example, which I worked out. I hope I got my math right. But um, I looked at the, uh, this is the Aedes aegypti, which is the mosquito in charge of uh, spreading all the uh, um, the uh, uh, the uh, dengue fever, and um, the uh, this particular mosquito can carry its payload in terms of our human of the of the blood that it can carry is about 300 percent of of its weight, and I compare that to a jumbo jet, which can carry about 28 percent of its uh, gross maximum takeoff weight um, as a payload. So it, it's about the uh, the mosquito has about 300 percent. Uh, uh, advantage over the most advanced, or one of the most advanced uh, aircraft. And this, and this um, the, the beauty of this figure here is that it kind of it should really blow our mind that all flying objects, um, uh, these are powered flights, uh, so creatures that fly under their own power, including aircraft, um, have a related by one equation, and this was, um, this was derived by a gentleman by the name of Hank Teneke at MIT, who was uh, at the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And the relationship uh, relates wing loading, uh, so W is the area of the wing, and how much weight is carried by that wing, W over S, and um, that is related to 0 0.38 of the velocity squared. And again, that's, that kind of is a very, very unusual uh, result. Of course, we have um, issues with plumbing, the, ju the, the, uh, uh, the fantastic plumbing that all creatures enjoy, which is, again, very, very beautiful because not only does it have to fight uh, gravity, but it manages gravity. So it deals with gravity in very, very ingenious ways, such as you, ha uh, you can see with the, with the, with the, uh, with the giraffe. But also, we don't have to go to a giraffe to appreciate this, because um, I think the human body, the, if we spread all the blood vessels in the human body and put them uh, you know, uh, lengthwise, um, they span about 100,000 kilometers, so about 62,000 miles. And that's really amazing plumbing. Uh, now, our senses are a little bit deceptive, 
because the first sense that comes to mind, of course, is sight. So we have sight. The green ones, as you see here, are the, one, are the traditional uh, senses. So we have the five senses which we all think of. But then there are other untraditional ones, such as um, the sense of equilibrium, the sense of pain, the sense of heat, and body awareness. So these are senses, because if people get something wrong with their middle ear, they lose their sense of equilibrium. This is a sense. Uh, but we don't consider it as part of the uh, traditional senses. Now, uh, the area of neuroscience um, is one of the fascinating areas that looked into beauty and investigated beauty in a very accurate way. And here we have on the left uh, our MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which studies brain anatomy, so it just looks at the structure of the brain. Whereas on the right with Homer Simpson is the, well, both are Homer Simpson, actually. Anybody likes the Simpsons here? I mean, I'm, I'm great. Okay, thank you. Um, the, um, on the right is uh, fMRI, which looks at the brain function. So you can start doing things to the brain and seeing how the image comes out and what's happening to the brain as you're doing these things to the brain. And one of the really amazing areas is is a case called uh, propoprognosia, which is a condition where we have uh, w people suffer from this condition. They fail to recognize fa faces. So they'll have regular intelligence, and you can deal with them as normal human beings, except they will lose the ability to recognize faces. And they found out that the two areas in charge of this are these two red areas on the, on the upper picture, so, oops. I can do it from here, I guess. So, these two red areas over here. Um, and these areas are just dedicated to the recognition of faces, which is really kind of um, it kind of blows my mind, at least. It should blow everybody's mind. That the brain, when we see things, um, it breaks things down into certain compartments, and then it puts the picture back together again. So putting Humpty Dumpty back together again is really an amazing, uh, an amazing feat that our brain has to deal with all the time. And that's the, um, the fusiform face area, those two areas. And so we have a, an area in our brain that's dedicated to the recognition of just faces. So dealing with the face of Hedy Lamarr, et cetera, we have a, a place that in our brain that just deals with faces, which doesn't necessarily deal with memory. So if I see a picture of my father, I'm very happy um, because I recognize the face, but it also goes to, my, to certain other areas of the brain, the hippocampus, where I get memories that this person was my father and this is a person that I love dearly. And this is an MRI, an actual MRI of the, of the area of the brain. So we look at faces. We have three main um, uh, characteristics that define beautiful faces. One of them is symmetry. Uh, so symmetry, the area between left and right. And that's really bilateral symmetry. We'll talk about different types of symmetry in a moment. But that's the simplest symmetry that in my profession, in my specialization, we deal with. So, it's, and it's like, really, that's the dumbest type of symmetry. That's the most basic type of symmetry. Symmetry between right and left. Uh, but we'll find that there are other types of symmetries that we can talk about. So symmetry defines beauty in faces. And another one uh, has to do with taste, which we acquire uh, culturally. And this, I, I brought this slide in because it, it demonstrates um, that when this painting came out, the regatta by, by Monet, um, it was considered to be child stuff. So people didn't think it was really art at all. And uh, they didn't really want to consider it as uh, any sort of the cultural heritage in, in France. And similarly with the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower um, was also considered to be a very, very ugly piece of, uh, of architecture because of it, all the steel and because it represented just uh, 
concrete, I shouldn't say con concrete, uh, maybe wrong word, not concrete, the concrete that you mix, but actually just uh, brute strength through steel. And so they, the only reason they decided to keep it was because they wanted to show us in the Paris exhibition and uh, they, uh, the whole bunch of um, uh, cultural experts decided that it should be taken down right after the exhibition and they should get rid of it. But they stayed and they became part of our acquired taste and culture. So going back to faces, we talked about symmetries, about cultural acceptance. Another one is average, averaging. So what's averaging? This particular photograph is actually a composite of all of these images. So they had basically millions of images going to make a face. It's not a real face. It's a computer-generated face by all the different images. And all the images um, came up with this face, which was considered to be a beautiful face. And um, so now averages are not plain. So when we talk about an average face, we're not talking about a plain face, but a face that has all the uh, sort of typical features that one will see every day. And when you put all of these together, then you feel comfort towards the face. The third um, issue, or actually the fourth, because we have culture here also, is uh, our hormones. And hormones to the extent that a face can uh, reflect uh, how, how feminine is the face, then you see this lady is pretty, or masculine, how masculine is the face when you have uh, the uh, male hormones, then you, then you know this is a handsome, uh, handsome guy, handsome face. Um, so from faces we move to shapes, uh, and with circles, um, uh, circle of course has, um, ha has, uh, has beauty because it represents a wholesome, um, a wholesome uh, shape. And uh, the, uh, there is a song, you know, this is, um, I've been trying to do this for a long time, but there is a song about pie uh, in, uh, in English, and one in German, and one in French, but we don't have one in Arabic. So if anybody is good at poetry, and you want to come up with, you want to become famous, come up with a, with a poet some, somehow that, uh, that, uh, that you can express pie. Because the whole idea is, uh, is uh, people try to memorize pi to a lot of significant figures. And, uh, you know, such as this one, can I find a trick recalling pi easily? And can is uh, three, and I is one, uh, find is four, A, one, and that will give you 3.14159, etc. And I think, um, I, think I, I know it to like seven or eight figures. I used to anyway, but uh, not anymore. Um, but um, anyway, um, sorry, I keep going backwards. So again, with spheres, we have the beauty of the surface to volume ratio, which makes it very, very uh, efficient. And spheres also represent economy and strength. And uh, this is best illustrated uh, in uh, buckyballs. May I see how many chemistry majors are here? Can you? Do you have any chemistry majors? I have something to show you, if I may. <coughs> Does anybody know what this is? It's a buckyball. This is, this is a buckyball. In 1985, uh, three uh, chemists got together. I think one of them was a physicist. And they, they started investigating one of the um, uh, carbon... Um, uh, 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 carbon uh, isotopes, and it was uh, carbon-60, and uh, it turned out that uh, they came up with this shape, which was around for a long time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think they probably saw football, and they said, well, well maybe it's that shape. But anyway, the, the carbon-60 has 60 carbon atoms. Um, so it's, uh, th this shape meets in 60 points, and it's a combination of 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. So whenever you see a football, you're looking really at a buckyball. And I think, uh, they, well, they call it a buckyball because it's named after Buckminster Fullerene, who, who was an architect and he was also a mathematician, and he used to love the shape. He used to love geodesic domes. And uh, there is, I think, a branch of chemistry right now called uh, uh, Fullerene chemistry, which is where they have graphene and things like that. So it's just an interesting uh, twist to your uh, chemistry class to think about uh, soccer balls.
because that's what the molecule kind of looks like over here, which is really derived from the shape. And I think they won a Nobel Prize for their work. Let me show you this, uh, the beacon. Um, I've always been fascinated by this shape, the one on the bottom here. Does anybody, uh, how many mathematicians do we have here? Can you raise your hand, please? Has anybody seen this one before? This is called Gabriel's Horn, uh, or Torricelli's Funnel, and it's a 17th century um, uh, figure, which was the first of its type to show that you can have an object with infinite surface, but finite volume. And I don't know if that sounds crazy to you, but it sounds crazy to me. It sounds really crazy to me, because how can you have an infinite surface and a finite volume? Uh, but that's really what this shape represents. So it's the uh, uh, x, uh, f of x is equal to 1 over x, and you rotate it, uh, all this calculus fancy stuff. But um, if you look at the, comp the um, similarity between that and your beacon out there, um, I, think, I think it is similar to a certain extent. If you can imagine extending that beacon up to you know, outer space, which is about 100 kilometers up in space, I think it can pass for a for a Torricelli's uh, funnel. Anyway, um, let me, I promised uh, a gentleman here that I would show the, uh, another fascinating shape, which is I cut, I cut by hand, um, which is the amazing Mobius strip. So I'll just uh, cut this paper here, and I have a piece of paper with uh, this is not magic or anything. I'm not going to pull out rabbits. I'm going to love this very. But if we uh, label one side A and another side B, and so we have sides A and side B, and uh, the uh, if I give it half a twist, now I can get a new shape, and you might notice that with this new shape, what's happening here is that I now have a surface which only has one side. There's no A and B anymore. A and B are on the same side. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, what's really amazing is that uh, not only do you have one side, but you also have one edge. Now I have a I have some glue here. I'm going to try to fish out of my... I carry... I don't carry all this stuff normally, so... So let me just glue this, because I need to show you. This, this, gets, this, this is going to get really good. So I'm going to glue this here to make it all in one shape. So now I have a surface which only has one side and one edge yeah? and if I take my pen and roll it over here it will actually just keep on rolling and rolling but there's more because this is the only shape where if you start with a clockwise motion all of a sudden it's going to become a counterclockwise motion so along along the motion you move from clockwise to counterclockwise does everybody believe me? Yes. Okay, I'm glad because I'm getting some strange looks. So either you know about this or I'm, you know, <laughs> or I'm just showing you something that's really unusual. But there is more also because this has practical applications. I mean, it's not just an object for fun. Uh, practical applications are in um, fan belts in your car or machines in general because if you have a fan belt with this design, it's going to wear on two sides. So it'll extend the wear. So instead of having it wear on one side, it's going to wear on two sides. Now, I'm going to try to do this. I'm not very good at it. But if you, if you do this at home, this is a lot of fun. If you, if you cut it, if you cut the, the uh, shape with the scissors, guess what's going to happen? Does anybody want to guess what's going to happen? I'm sorry? It's going to... Oh, 
all of a sudden it's going to double in diameter. And then if you cut it again, it's just going to keep getting bigger. And we do all this, this all day, it's going to become bigger than this auditorium, supposedly. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. But uh, let me show you my, one of my favorite things about uh, the, the, the Mobius strip. And by the way, this is may, may, named after a real person whose name was Mobius. He was a German mathematician, a man who specializes in topology, science of surfaces. If I put a, a hole with my pencil from side A to side B like that, it represents a very weird philosophical principle because A and B are on the same side. So how did it get from here to there when they're on the same side? Think about that one. Uh, anyway. We, uh, so we looked at the uh, Torricelli shape and the Mobius strip. Um, hexagons, of course, are uh, very, very unusual shapes in, uh, in terms of beauty because we think of hexagons for, um, uh, and how they're used in, um, by bees to build their, their nests. And, uh, and actually, there are still papers written. The last one, I think, was about 10 years ago about how bees do this and why they do this. And I think one of the reasons is, is the economy because bees can build five, if they build five, um, five uh, cells, they get uh, two of them bakhshish, they get two of them for free. Because you get the one in the middle, you don't have to build it, and you get all the different sides which will build a new one. So you build five and you get seven. That's kind of cool, I think. Um, and hexagons, of course, in chemistry, and we do have chemists over here, and organic chemists especially, with all the carbon uh, rings that you have. And that's how it started with a straight uh, with a straight structure, and then it ended up as being a carbon ring by this uh, gentleman over here. Kukule, I think is his name. Um, packing design for uh, all different types of things, and the um, shape, of course, that is preferred is the, uh, is the hexagonal shape, uh, even in, uh, in Roman and pomegranates, and in corn as well. But um, this is probably the only slide from my area, uh, my, uh, in terms of cities and city planning. In market areas, we found that uh, the shape that uh, tends to give you the best arrangement for market areas and for the spatial distribution of cities is the hexagon. Uh, another interesting one is soap. I love soap. I, I, I buy so much soap, it's ridiculous. But, um, and I, um, uh, the bubbles, if you look at one single bubble, the best shape for that bubble, the shape that will give you the best economy, is a sphere, which we just talked about because of the uh, surface-to-volume ratio. But, the, but whenever bubbles congregate, whenever they get together, they will tend to, um, to be hexagons. So they tend to form these 120 degrees um, between um, the bubbles, the surfaces of the bubbles, and uh, that will give you hexagons. So next we talk about... Um, uh, the num numbers of beauty, and one number that comes to mind when we talk about beauty is uh, phi, which is called the golden ratio, which is 1.618, and it has a lot of uh, you know, properties. People probably overdo it with phi, but I think it's worth knowing about. So the number of beauty is 1.618. It's kind of like saying the number of the devil is 666, but this is the number of beauty. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very, very unusual number. It basically cuts a line into a larger to a smaller segment, and the ratio between the larger to the smaller segment is 1.618. It provides us with a lot of symmetry, which I'll explain in a minute. And we talked about symmetry earlier being just uh, bilateral symmetry, but now we'll look at a new type of symmetry, which is rotational symmetry. So if you imagine yourself a bee uh, coming down on this, uh, visiting this, uh, this flower to pick up some pollen, and you're in a weird sort of angle, you'll always see the, uh, the, uh, the flower more or less the same shape because of the symmetrical uh, arrangement. And the symmetrical arrangement happens to be a pentagon. And the pentagon has an infinite number of um, uh, phi's, infinite number of, of golden sections. So types of symmetry, 
Um, and if we can look at symmetry as being change without change, and that's really a concept from taking from physics. Phys physicists love to talk about change without change. So they talk about symmetry in all sorts of equations. But for a lesser uh, level of um, complexity, we talk about sy symmetry of rotation. So if you rotate something and it stays the same, then it's symmetrical. Of translation, so if you change it around and it stays the same, the center stays the same, then it's symmetrical. Of mirror ro uh, symmetry, and of uh, bilateral symmetry, which I mentioned is, is, the, is the traditional one. And let me talk a little bit about mirrors. Uh, I forgot I have a mirror that I usually bring, or that I like to carry with all the uh, stuff for this lecture. But uh, with mirrors, um, they've always fascinated me personally because of the way they reflect, because of the way they change things. So they reflect right to left, right? Do they? Right to left? I don't think they reflect right to left. I think they reflect, I think they say front to back, but it's uh, still uh, very, very strange what, how mirrors do this, because why don't they reflect up and down, for example? Um, and just when you think you know enough about mirrors, they still surprise you with a lot of um, strange things. So let me give you an example. And I, I have an article, when, when Dr. Omar mentioned my 900 articles, these are not all published and re refereed articles. These are, a lot of them are journal articles uh, in, the, in, a, um, uh, in the daily newspaper Ocas, uh, which comes out actually on Thursday today. And I wrote an article once about mirrors, and I wrote about how mirrors are used in magic. And magicians love to use mirrors because mirrors fool us like crazy. Um, traditionally, magicians use mirrors and smoke, of course. That's, and the re one of the reasons they use smoke is they love to have very, very low lighting conditions. So I'm going to give you an experiment to do tonight. And if you don't get in touch with me after you do this, but just, just keep it for yourself, if you please. And the experiment goes as follows, if you, if you, like, if you like this sort of thing. Um, Sit in your room in front of the mirror with the lights out totally, totally out. And then introduce just enough light for your nighttime vision to kick in. So you're going to have the minimal amount of light that you can have in the room. And you're still looking at yourself in the mirror. Okay. And then describe what you see. And I can bet you that you're not going to see yourself as you know yourself right now. So just try it. A lot of people have hated me about this. I got a lot of hate mail uh, because of this uh, experiment. But it's, what happens, um, just to explain the science part that I know, is that our brains, as we mentioned earlier, Humpty Dumpty principle, because the brain is modular and it translates things or different um, uh, images in different parts of the brain and puts them all together again. So we use a lot of visual intelligence and in casting out a lot of things that we don't need. Well, the, you're introducing a very strange concept to the brain now because there is a transformation in the mirror and because of the low light, and sometimes the brain cannot fill in the images quite as well as it usually does in full lighting conditions. So sometimes you'll get to see some really wild stuff. And I've had, I've had some of my students describe some amazing Amazing stuff. I won't tell you what it is, but try it for yourself. And I'll, I'll provide my email so you can send me. If you see good stuff, send it to me. If you, if you do see bad stuff, don't tell me, please. In terms of symmetry, um, the, uh, um, when, you can, uh, when you can read things forwards and backwards, I forgot the word. Um, palindrome, thank you so much. Palindromes. So um, when, when you have this, uh, p these palindromic uh, uh, tricks that you, um, that you can do, and uh, I, I, lo I love this because not only can you um, have symmetrical transformations or symmetrical uh, cons constructs in, in, um, in, in, um, in objects, but you can also have them in language, which, re which is really fascinating. So you can make, have sentences that read forwards and backwards in the same way. Not just words. Words like radar, for example, radar, R-A-D-A-R, is a palindromic word. But you can have whole sentences. So, so, for example, like this one, you can cage a swallow, can't you? 
but you can't swallow a cage, can you? And if you read it this way or that way, it's the tree is exactly the same. Fascinating, uh, for me anyway. Um, but you can also, in, in Arabic, we have uh, this as well. So, مَوَدَّتَهُ تَدُومُ لِكُلِّ هَوْلٍ وَهَلْ كُلِّ مَوَدَّتَهُ تَدُومُ And if you read it forwards or backwards, it reads the same. Um, the uh, star magic, as I mentioned, um, the uh, stars, um, the, uh, the triangles that you see here, we were just visiting the museum just before coming over here, and we saw all the tetrahedrons, um, the pyramids, and they're all uh, golden rectangles. A golden rectangle has a, oops, a golden rectangle has uh, the longer sides divided by the shorter sides are in the proportion of 1.16. So it, it matches the, the, per, the uh, golden section perfectly. Excuse me, I won't go into all the details of this because um, it's going to take a while, but, but there, are, there are, believe me, there are infinite number, infinite number of, of golden numbers inside a, um, inside a, a pentagon. And maybe that's one of the reasons why pentagons were also used in, in magic and, you know, that sort of thing, because it has this power to, to uh, fascinate. Um, going back to flowers and phi, uh, the golden number, and, uh, and, the, uh, and, the pentag and the pentagon, well, a lot of flowers um, that, of plants that bear fruit are pentagons or have or have five pe petals um, in them and if you this would be one area to explore so as you're walking along taking your morning walk look at the, look a lot a lot of the flowers and you'll find that um, many of them are if not most of flowering plant of uh, uh, plants that bear fruit are are actually uh, five uh, they have uh, they have pentagons or they have five petals so uh, we find it in fruits as well I was, uh, I have an apple that I was going to show you here. I don't do this all the time, but uh, this is a special crowd, so. Sorry. So as you can see, the, the seeds inside are um, shaped in a, in a, inside of a, of a, of a pentagon. And, a, and um, same thing. I, w I won't do it with this one, just take my word for it. I, I don't want to stand here cutting fruits all day, but... So, um, in, a, in a pear as well, you'll see that. And uh, the... Uh, so, in, in pears, we'll see that also. And we'll find it also in the... Uh, in uh, the Yusufendi in the uh, tangerines. You'll find it in, in the inside here. So, this is the apple. And uh, we'll find the pentagons as well in papaya, a lot of type of papaya. And the beauty of this is you can, you can check this at home and tell me if, I, if you didn't find it, if, you didn't, if it was not accurate, uh, if my description was not accurate. So pentagons here as well. And uh, other plants. Uh, pineapples are an interesting case, and I have a story to tell about pineapples. I brought my own pineapple here to show you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, if you count... The, you'll see that the, 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 the uh, pattern here is arranged in a kind of in a, in a, falling, in a fall, falling line. And if you count the lines that go clockwise and count num the lines that go counterclockwise, it should be 8 and 13. And if you divide 13 into 8, uh, both are Fibonacci numbers and you get the, the golden number. You get 1.618. And... Um, uh, you'll find it in other things as well, but the story here is that I, uh, I remember I, ha I was giving this talk once, and I, I went to the supermarket, and I, uh, I went to the supermarket, and I wanted to check it, because I wanted to take the pineapple personally and show it to people, to show it to my audience. And so I stood, in the su and I was in a hurry, so I went to the supermarket, and I went to the fruit section, and I grabbed the pineapple, and I started counting all the different sections. And, and they matched, so I was very happy, and I started going like this. And there were a whole bunch of people stand there watching me do this. And I was just thinking, I wonder what they're thinking, this crazy guy, what's he doing with the pineapple? You know, it's, uh, like, uh, um, so we have it in uh, spirals as well. Um, 
in the uh, golden sand. And of course, if you recognize this triangle, this is a triangle that you find in a star on the sides of the star. So you imagine the star as being a pentagon with the, with the five, uh, with the five, uh, with the five stars around it. Uh, we'll find the shape also in a lot of beautiful things like uh, uh, butterflies uh, with the symmetry and the length of the of the wings, the span of the butterfly divided by its uh, its height. Uh, we find it as powerful attractions for you for smokers. Uh, uh, s um, cigarette design, the box itself is typically in a golden section. Um, the morning cup of coffee, the swirl that you have uh, follows a. It does not uh, follow a, um, a uh, uh, th there are two types, there is another type of spiral, which is not the, um, uh, this spiral. The spiral keeps its shape as it gets bigger. Another spiral uh, has a more compact shape, but this one is the, um, is the one that, uh, that deals more with, with phi, the uh, golden section. Um, if you look at uh, ads for watches, you'll find that they're most of the time 10 past 10, and there is a reason for that, and it's not to show, at least I don't think it's to show the brand of the watch, because sometimes the brand is on the side. And the reason is that it has to do with the golden section, because there are actually two angles here. The outer angle is 222.5, and the inner angle is 137.5, and if you divide them, you'll get the golden section, 1.618. This is my most important star. This is my son, Najm, one of my children. I actually called him Najm because I was so uh, happy with the stars, etc. and then I decided to call one of my children star. Um, plant growth, um, how does phi or how does the golden section manifest itself in plant growth? Through uh, plants do not just grow all of them radially like that, they grow one by one. And the pattern that they follow as they are growing actually follows the, um, equal, the, the spiral, the uh, spiral that we just showed, which, which follows the, um, the golden section. So the growth of the, of the plants, actually uh, each, each one of these buds grows at a certain time and they, they'll follow the, the spiral shape like that. So here we have another uh, 137 and 222.5 in celestial bodies. Um, I'm gonna hurry because I think I'm running out of time. Yeah? So we have um, in, uh, in built objects as well, like in, uh, in the pyramids, um, uh, this is the great pyramid Khufu in, in Cairo, um, and uh, this, this is, these are dimensions in feet, and it, fo it, it kind of approximates, it's not exact, I mean people just take this thing and they blow it out of proportion, but I'm just kind of giving you a taste of some of the things that are happening in, the, in this area. So it's kind of 1.61, it's not 100% exact, but it's close. Um, the Parthenon. In, in Greece, um, in Athens, and that's actually how the Phi got the name Phi. It was called Tau in the beginning, and then they changed the name because the architect who designed the Parthenon uh, was, was enamored by this uh, ratio, so they called it Phi after his name. United, building, uh, uh, United Nations building in uh, New York, um, which was designed by Le Courboisier, a sw very famous Swiss uh, architect, who, um, who was also a great admirer of Phi, so um, it has the, the, the three golden rectangles. Um, and uh, this particular gentleman, uh, Le Corboisier, uh, designed everything around what he called a modulure, which was like a human being with perfect proportions, and the proportions were all based on the golden, uh, all based on the golden uh, section. So he designed a lot of projects in that. Uh, but let me tell you another thing that I found, and I, now, this is just speculative, okay, so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm on the right track, but uh, I love Jerusalem. Jerusalem is one of my favorite cities, and uh, the historical Jerusalem just has so much to offer uh, for any person who loves history and cities and culture and uh, just uh, civilization, I guess. Uh, Jerusalem has a very unique, I shouldn't say very unique, a unique space. Yeah. A unique space, which is the space of Qubba uh, al-Sahra, the, the Dome of the Rock. Um, Masjid al-Aqsa, if you look at the 
the space in Jerusalem. Now, this is, this is the, holy, the holy city, actually, the old city, I should say, the old city, is this whole area here. And this area that you see here, with the dome in the middle, is, follows kind of a golden uh, rectangle, a little bit. And like I said, this is just my own uh, observation. So Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, you know, I measured the sides, and it's not, of course, you know, you can't take a historical sp city, especially with organic pattern, and it'll come out all nice and straight. But it does follow a golden section to a certain uh, degree. Not 100%, but um, at least I like to think that it does. Uh, credit cards, we have all sorts of credit cards, and all sorts of cards, actually, not just credit cards, uh, have uh, the golden section, the golden ratio. If you measure the length of the card by its... Uh, by its width, it would come out to be one, uh, 1 1.618 approximately. This is my own hand. I got the X-ray, and uh, if you look, uh, the 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 length of the bones also follows this pattern. Um, other surprises. Um, this is a Boeing 747, and uh, I found it has two golden rectangles. And this is overkill, of course. I mean. Don't take this stuff too seriously. This is this is my own my own stuff. I wrote to Boeing about this, and they never answered me. So you have, uh, so they, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, wings. So wings, and you don't have to find the golden section in one place. It can be a combination. So it can be a composite. But I guess if you love it so much, like I do, you'll see it everywhere, of course. So if you love the golden section, you'll see the golden section everywhere. So. Um, uh, I'll, uh, special beauty, I guess, is uh, we were talking about jokes before coming over here, and there is something about jokes which is very, very special because, like I said, it doesn't have to be funny, but it has to have an unexpected twist, something that's a surprise in it. And this particular slide has a great surprise because I didn't realize, again, for lovers of The Simpsons, that The Simpsons a lot of the writers are mathematicians, and they're Harvard graduates. So these guys are very smart. And in a lot of um, episodes, they injected um, some really, really intelligent stuff. One of which is the uh, Euler identity, which you see over here. Uh, so this is supposed to be the most uh, beautiful identity in mathematics. And that's the one. So, so math does have its beauty, but I think a lot of people probably will not see this until you explain it to them. But once it's explained, the fact that it links together a lot of very unusual numbers and a lot of unusual operations in one very short um, you know, identity, uh, it's very, very special. It would be like a 20-second joke. You know those really short jokes? Somebody tell, tells you a short joke, a one-liner, and it's uh, extremely funny. And if you don't think it's funny, at least you think it's very, very intelligent. And I think that's uh, one of them. So anyway, um, in the end, I just want to mention that uh, it's always great to see beauty in everything that you do. Because we see beauty all around us, like with a joke with the two fish, with water, the idea of water. We see beauty every day, uh, every hour, every minute. But we just, we just don't feel it. And... Uh, It'd be great to actually stop and, and, uh, and uh, look at beauty in a, and, and search for it. And, uh, and I like to also use this concept of the cheesecake. Now, cheesecake is... How many people like cheesecake here? Please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Everybody does. Anybody lactose intolerant over here? I am, but I still eat cheesecake. I, uh, cheesecake is, I think, uh, a very uh, vicious form of food because it doesn't really provide anything except great taste. I think the nutritional value of cheesecake is almost zero, and if any biologists here can uh, confirm this, but the cheesecake doesn't really offer you anything except fantastic taste. So I'm not saying go to the extreme case of the cheesecake, but at least things like you know a simple uh, strawberry, except for people, of course, who have um, allergies to strawberries, uh, be worth it to, you know, uh, think about the strawberry, maybe touch it before you eat it, you know, wash your hands, of course, and touch the strawberry before you eat it, maybe smell it before you eat it, maybe listen to it as you're eating to it, and take a moment to really, really enjoy it, because we take a lot of things for granted. 
So that's really the, the message that, I'm, uh, uh, that I'd like to give over here. This will hopefully will be continued. I keep working on this uh, yeah, more and more as we go along. And uh, I'm not sure if it's getting better or worse over, over time, but I, I try to make it better. Thank you so much. Questions, anyone? Is this a mic? Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you. Really, it, uh, That's a beautiful mic. <laughs> yeah, just, I can see the beauty. Um, it's a very beautiful presentation. I really want to thank you for that. You. Um, I have a question. Uh, it was in my mind for a long time, and I think you've uh, answered part of that question, but I still I need some maybe more uh, solid answer. Now, when you talk about beauty, usually beauty is related to art. And then uh, when we want to talk about art, people start to study art or understand art. and you're kind of putting some fundamentals and basics for beauty. It seems like there are some uh, basic concepts or I would say some theories for beauty. But I think if I want to teach someone art, so I'm not teaching him art. Actually, I'm moving him away from being an artist. Is this a message? I don't know. Am I doing something right here? Is this the way I should think about it? Or art is, has to be based on a valid science? In theory. Right. I think I might disagree with you that beauty is related to art. I think art is related to beauty because beauty came first. You're, with art, you're trying to express the beauty. It's not the other way around. So um, whether, all the, whether you can find a science to express the art, I think you can, for sure. Um, I failed to bring some uh, uh, drawings by M.C. Escher, who was... Uh, a uh, brilliant uh, Dutch um, uh, uh, artist who uh, used uh, concepts from mathematics to uh, create some brilliant, um, uh, brilliant uh, uh, pieces that, uh, that uh, I don't know why I didn't bring it uh, today. Usually I present it. But uh, it doesn't have to be mathematics or physics or biology. But at least it has to relate to our feelings of beauty. And I think the, the idea that... Uh, or um, that it's there in the brain, and neuroscientists have found areas in the brain that relate to different concepts of beauty, means that there is a science there. So it doesn't mean we go have to find the science or study the science to make the art meaningful, but at least it's there if you look for it. It will just make the art a little bit more meaningful and closer to beauty. And I know I didn't touch on art today, but it will make this topic any... It's already very um, yeah, dispersed, and it will make it even more, uh, more ethereal, if you will, if we put art and beauty and science all in one, in one talk. It's, it's going to be, ta it's already taxing for my, <laughs> on my brain, and it, it'll be even more so if I put all three of them together. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah probably maybe we can talk later. Right. So maybe it means it was really either very, very clear, everybody understood everything, or that you totally disagree with me, but you're being nice to me, so you're not asking me any questions. So. <laughs> no more questions? Right. Right. Thank you. I didn't talk about color, and I didn't talk about music, uh, all the three senses. I didn't talk about So lots of things I didn't talk about today, but like I said, it's a bit huge topic anyway. So, uh, as an urbanist and, and, and uh, a beautician, uh, what are the most appealing cities that, uh, that you have seen? And how can we make Jeddah, a city so close to us and so close to your heart, apparently, yes. uh, a more beautiful city? That's an excellent question. I, like I said, I like Jerusalem is definitely my favorite city, especially the old city, um, because it's endured so much and it stayed uh, it's kept its character despite all the horrible things that have happened to that city. 
<coughs> the central area in particular. And uh, there are other cities uh, that I love. Uh, I love Portland, for example, in the United States, and Seattle, uh, beautiful, very, very well-designed cities. Uh, but um, how can we make Jeddah more? Uh, so the first part of your question is, what's my favorite city? Jerusalem, for sure. Uh, how can we? And as a matter of fact, I have a lot of respect for war cities, war-torn cities, like Beirut, like uh, Stalingrad. You know, cities can endure so much uh, punishment and still survive. And if you, human beings definitely cannot do that. Companies cannot do that. Most companies last, I think half of Forbes companies, Forbes listed companies last less than 25 years. Uh, cities last for thousands of years. So um, war-torn cities, but especially Jerusalem, to answer your first part of your question. How can we make Jeddah more uh, beautiful? Well, it's starting to get better, but I think that we still have a long way, to, a long ways to go. Jeddah is overbuilt and it's overcrowded, um, and it's um, it needs a lot of work to become a city beautiful. But you know, we have all the makings of a beautiful city in Jeddah because of the artwork that we have. We have some of the beautiful sculptures in the, on the Corniche, and now we have the new Corniche. I don't know if anybody's tried walking there. It's a it's a great walk. I go there every, almost every day. So it's a, it's a great, uh, there is great potential, but we have a long ways to go. And I wish I could answer that in one sentence. How can you make Jeddah more beautiful? But I would say more, we need more parks. There are 700 par parks in Jeddah that are unused. 700, not 70, 700 parks. So that, there is an area that's uh, you know, ripe for development that we can work on. Um, we can get rid of a lot of these overbuilt areas with high density. Some of the areas are just the density is too high. Um, and we were talking about this. The whole idea of in urban planning, when you want to build high densities, you should have more parks, more open space right next to it, like you have in Paris, for example. In Jeddah, that's what they tried to do. So they build these high densities, and then some people came and they stole the parks. <laughs> So they took the parks and they built more buildings. Right? So it ended up being, when you're landing uh, in Jeddah, you typically come from the south, and if you look outside the window on both sides, you'll see a city that's just like a concrete, uh, you know, I mean, it's just a, one concrete gargantuan uh, globule. So it's not right. We need to do more work. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm start to thank you, Prof. Uh, Tarek, for this nice uh, presentation. Uh, actually, I have uh, a question uh, to you as an urban planner, and in, in these uh, difficult uh, days and important days for for Saudi Arabia, I uh, understand uh, it's difficult uh, to work on a place like Jeddah and make it more uh, beautiful. But uh, uh, I think in these days we have a chance. We have a nice place, nice community, like, uh, for example, Kaust here. And we have uh, a big, large uh, project. It's new. Uh, I hope you take part uh, in this project. Uh, my question is um, how we can develop a small or, uh, or very, um, uh, you, you have to mention and talk about scale. Can we have very small unit? which is sustainable, beauty, can provide what we expect in, in, in a small city. I know it's not my question is, could be take time to answer, but uh, we can have a discussion later if you want. Thank you. You know, everybody loves small cities, including me. I love small cities, but I wouldn't live in one right? because larger cities just offer so much more opportunity and uh, a better quality of life, believe it or not. A lot of people say huge cities are a terrible place to live because, you know, uh, crime and pollution, etc. But when you look at indicators of the quality of life in large cities in terms of education, healthcare, uh, shopping choices, uh, you know, supermarkets, malls, etc. Uh, bigger cities are always, always win hands down. They win hands down against the small, not just in Saudi Arabia, but almost everywhere in the world. And that is why, right now, over half of the world's population are living in cities. 
not in villages, not in rural areas. Half of the world's population. Actually, this happened quite a few years ago, and they're looking at a huge uh, increase in, in the percentage of people living in, in cities and in, larger, in large cities, in million, million plus uh, cities. Uh, many years ago, yani, I think in the 1950s, they used to have like uh, four or five mega cities over 10 million, and today there are, I think, uh, over 100. So it's uh, quite an incredible number. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the very insightful presentation. Oh. It was lovely. Um, so beauty is something that's very subjective. Uh, how do you think that... Um, Beauty is something that's so subjective. How is the Golden Triangle so um, attractive to so many people? And are there people who don't like the aesthetic of the Golden Triangle? Okay. Thank you. Um, I might disagree with you. Do you think it's still subjective after all this talk? I think so, yeah. I think really? that beauty is something that's very subjective. Okay, I'm willing to challenge that by maybe distributing a survey here and asking about certain things that we this, uh, that we agree on, on about beauty, and you'll find that we agree on the beauty of a lot of things. For example, roses, uh, you know. Can I show hands of roses? I think roses are beautiful. Uh, apples. Uh, strawberries. Are you watching? Are you watching the hands going up? I mean, if it was subjective, maybe it wouldn't be as... Uh, uh, Hedy Lamar, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, <laughs> Hedy Lamar maybe, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, um, you know what, here's a good example, maybe I should have used that in my presentation, they showed babies, newborn babies, faces, pictures of faces, and newborn babies were smiling at certain faces more than others, and they were smiling at symmetrical faces. How about that one? No, do you think that's subjective? No, that's so interesting. I mean, that goes with the uh, with the whole idea of sy symmetry being one of the one of the uh, issues in in. Uh, in so, uh, are there people who don't like the aesthetic that the Golden Triangle presents? I don't know of any, but you know what? I'd love to see. Yeah. I have a friend who's a radiologist, and he ha he has a huge um, MRI machine in Jeddah, and I'd love to see him do some of these studies and showing people uh, things or objects and measuring what their brain are, is doing on the, on the MRI machine, because that's what fMRI is all about. And people, unfortunately, haven't done this. They've done it with faces, but not with other objects. So it'd be interesting to show them geometric uh, figures, like you said, with, uh, with a golden ratio, and to see how their brain will react once they see these images. I, I think I haven't seen any studies uh, that dealt with that. Or any mathematical uh, uh, figures of any sort, as a matter of fact. Nobody's done fMRI on mathematical or geometric, uh, or um, mathematical uh, 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 shapes or uh, geometry. Thank you. So, did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Salam alaikum. First, yes. thank you. <coughs> I have only one question. I believe that uh, practicality goes very well with beauty. Or actually, beauty is the product. But recently, especially seeing big cities and urban design, you see that practicality destroys beauty very much. How we can resolve this issue? Okay, thank you. That's, that's a great question. But again, I might disagree with that practicality and beauty go hand in hand because of the cheesecake. So uh, sometimes uh, beauty is not necessarily practical at all. So a beautiful face uh, has nothing to do with uh, reflecting, sometimes, with reflecting the health of that person or the ability of a lady to conceive children or of a man to be a good father. So, but sometimes that you'll see that a face as being handsome or beautiful, uh, for a man handsome, for a lady beautiful, uh, which has nothing to do with practicality. But if you go into city planning, uh, you're right, we start out with beautiful, all cities, by the way, start out beautiful, all planned cities. If you look at any planned city on this planet, they started out looking great. On paper, they look fantastic. And when we look at them, and uh, when we look at the plans, they look great. 
But then you go look at the reality, and they look totally different. And they, unfortunately, look a lot worse. Because of things like grabbing parks, not developing areas, uh, cars parking on the street on, the cur on top of curbs, uh, squatters living in, uh, in certain open areas. So how do we deal with this? You know, these are difficult questions. I, I'm not sure if I can answer them right away. But it takes tough measures, and sometimes beauty has a very... Remember the second slide I showed that beauty can be very costly? Sometimes beauty has a very high cost. If you want to have a, a, a truly beautiful city, it can be very, very costly, because you'll have to do, take so many measures that will make that city very difficult, I mean, very expensive to live in. Okay, so um, you mentioned a lot of like mathematics uh, when it comes to um, beauty. So I was wondering, um, what's your take on the whole is math invented or discovered based on all of the points you mentioned? Is it? Um, I'm not really qualified to answer that. First of all, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not that great in math, but yeah. I, love, I love this whole concept of beauty and relating it to math. So it doesn't mean that I'm really qualified to you know, do all the fancy math stuff. And as a matter of fact, one of my professors used to tell me, you know, Tariq, you're telling me about the beauty of calculus? Don't tell me about the beauty of calculus. Solve the damn equation. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Well, I'm not you know, in Arabic. I'm not you won't go anywhere. <laughs> Sorry about using the swear word, but uh, but that's the word that he the word that he used. So, uh, like I said, I I savor and and enjoy the beauty of it, the beauty of the mathematical shapes and how they how they relate to each other and how they relate to different uh, concepts. But uh, I think your question goes above my head: whether math was invented or whether math was, uh, I think math is math. It's always going to be there. I mean, even if there are no human beings uh, in the universe, uh, we'll still have mathematics uh, there because the measurements, um, et cetera, they're, they're, they're going to be there. So whether we have, uh, you know, if we had like cats uh, instead of human beings on the planet and everybody's walking around meowing, they still have mathematics. They won't be as good. As, uh, as, as us in terms of creating things and designing things. Uh, but, uh, but, they, uh, but math will be there, whether they use it or not, I think it's going to be there. So more, lenient, so more lenient to the discovered side, basically. Well, I, I don't, yeah, to the discovered side, yeah. It's there and we just uh, find math transcends, transcends the, the, the uh, exploration, if you will. All right, on that note, I think uh, we've come to uh, the, um, the, the, the end of our um, uh, session today. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarek. This has certainly been a beautiful lecture. I, I, I have been specifically forbidden uh, to say what I'm going to say before the lecture, but now since the lecture is, is, is done, as you can see, and as usually our, our, our tradition, we, we, we recognize our keynote speakers with a present and we commemorate, commemorate that with a picture. But um, uh, Dr. Tarek came to us with uh, his own present, an autographed uh, copy of his book, One Planet. And he said, you're specifically forbidden from mentioning it because if you mention it, the whole lecture will be about the story of the first uh, Arab astronaut in space. So we hope to have him again and Thank you very much for the present as well.